قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to this live episode of Ask Zad. As usual we will take three questions from your emails then we will take your direct question or, or phone calls bi-idhnillahi uh, azza wa jal. So our first uh, question is from Brother Muhammad. Is the hadith, whoever dies on Friday or a night before Friday, will be safe from the punishment of the grave authentic? This hadith was narrated by uh, At-Tirmidhi and others and was authenticated by Sheikh Al-Albani, may Allah have mercy, on his soul. And hence, as we are laymen in the field of hadith. We follow Sheikh Al-Albani most of the time in his authentication of the hadiths. And therefore, we say that this hadith is authentic. Now, some scholars said that this hadith is not authentic. And they based their allegation upon logical concepts in the sense that they say, if a person dies on a Thursday or a Saturday, this is not in his hand. No one chooses to die on a specific day and gets what he desired. Therefore, what is the benefit of dying on a Friday where you would be exempted from the torment of the grave or the questioning of the angels, etc.? This doesn't make any sense and hence they graded the hadith to be weak in addition to other reasons, not only the logical reason in their sense. And this is the opinion of Sheikh Ibn Baz, Ibn Uthaymeen, and the likes. However, we find that as long as the hadith is authentic, there is no place for our logic to be applied here. And hence, we say that this is Allah's favors and blessing. If Allah graces us to die on a Friday, and he gives us this gift from his uh, a favor and blessing, alhamdulillah. If not, then he dealt with us, with us through his justice. So we're either between Allah's treating us with his justice or with his grace and favors, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And hence, I see no reason to um, consider this hadith not to be authentic. Sabah says, I heard it is prohibited to use the back door of the house for entry and exit. I'm wondering if this is true and what's the ruling on it? No, this is not true. This is totally baseless. When a house has multiple entrances and it's your own house and you enter from or exit from any entrance you wish, this is totally permissible and halal without any problem. Finally, Arif says, how much Zamzam water do we have to add to normal water for it to also become Zamzam water? This is a, a misconception that a lot of the Muslims believe that they can keep on adding water to little amount of Zamzam and the whole thing would become Zamzam. This is not true. Adding normal water to Zamzam water would give it some of the blessing of Zamzam. And yes, it can be also used to heal and cure illnesses like Zamzam, but it depends on the amount. So if one has a liter of Zamzam and another person has 100 milliliters of Zamzam and adds 900 milliliters of normal water, would they be the same? Of course not. 
the one with the one liter pure Zamzam has more benefits and healing powers and answering of the dua and barakah than the one that has 100 milliliters and added 900 milliliters of normal water to it. Nevertheless, this is better than normal water at all because it has this little amount of zamzam. So the scholars say it all depends on the ratio. The more the zamzam water is, the more blessing and healing power it has with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. And hence, if someone were to make an oath and says, if I drink other than zamzam, I will uh, nullify my uh, oath. And he drinks this water that has 900 milliliter of normal water and 100 milliliters of zamzam. Scholars say he has to expiate his oath because he did not fulfill it and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Misbah from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, my mother passed away. Uh, she hadn't been keeping her fast for quite some time. Uh, she was uh, sick, so she really couldn't keep the fast. She had been paying fidya for the entire time. How, so how, I'm long, wondering, how long time, yeah, Masbah? Uh, since 2014. And Six? she died in 2022. Okay, and she did, not, she did not expiate by feeding the poor for every day she missed? Not every day. Sometimes she would, sometimes she wouldn't. We really didn't know the ruling at the time. Okay. As I pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that he forgives her sins and accepts her among those whom he showers with his favors and blessing. As for the days missed, when a person falls sick, and his illness is chronic, he has to feed one poor person for every day missed. Hence, now that you've come to know the ruling, which you guys did not do fully, rather you did maybe 5%, 10% of it, you have to calculate the days and give the food to the poor, feeding one poor Muslim person for every day she had missed. And may Allah Azza wa accepts that. Abdullah from Canada. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam wa Sheikh, I saw one of your videos where you said that if I'm, uh, where you said that if I'm praying salah at home, it's okay to just move my tongue during the salah without any audible noise. My question is, can the same be applied for the adhkar after each salah? Okay, the ruling is, Abdullah, when the Prophet ﷺ was asked that make me accompany you in Jannah by one of his companions, so he said, لا يزال لسانك رطبا بذكر الله Your tongue must be moist with remembering Allah Azza wa Jal. From this hadith and others, scholars concluded that in order for our recitation, for our dhikr, for our uh, whatever we're worshiping Allah by, we have to move our lips and tongue, articulating whatever we want to say silently as if we're saying it loudly. Now, one would argue and say, okay, what happens if I were to keep my lips sealed and think in my head, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. So I, mm, my lips are sealed and I'm thinking of it. Wouldn't I be rewarded for that if I'm praying and I recite the Fatiha in Zuhr prayer, for example, and I keep my lips sealed? Wouldn't my prayer be valid? The vast majority of scholars say that your prayer is invalid. Whoa, why? I recited the Fatiha in my head. They say because this is like scanning. It's not actual reading. Some say and argue, but this doesn't make any sense. Allah knows what goes in my heart. We say this is true, but don't try to come up with excuses, lame excuses, without any proof or justification from the Quran or from the Sunnah. 
And I'll counter your logic by saying, if my lips are sealed and I think of evil thoughts or I desire sins and I fantasize about them, would I be sinful? You would jump and say, no, the Prophet said, والسلام, Allah has forgiven my ummah for whatever intrusive thoughts that cross their minds as long as they don't speak about it or act upon it. And I did not speak about it and I did not act upon it, so Allah will forgive it. The same thing goes for positive or for dhikr or for recitation of the Quran. If you don't move your lips and tongue, Allah will not accept that and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Nawfal from uh, Malaysia. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Sheikh, my question regarding the Kunu prayer. Uh, during the, uh, you know, the Palestine war, our masjid, almost all the masjid around the Malaysia, they conducted the Kunu prayer for one month for Palestine. And some masjid did stop it, but some still continue on and off uh, during the part prayer. So what should we do during as, the prayer? Okay, as followers of the Imam, when the Imam makes qunut, and this is known as qunutun nazila, the qunut that is performed when a calamity or a catastrophe happens to the Muslims. When the Imam does it, we say Amin whenever he makes the dua. We do not oppose what he's doing. However, the Sunnah is to do the Qunut not only in one prayer, rather in the five daily prayers. So you do it in Fajr, in Dhuhr, in Asr, in Maghrib, and in Isha. Some people only restrict this to Fajr only. And others restrict this to Fajr and Maghrib only. And this is or was said by some scholars, but the way of the Prophet والسلام, was to make this qunut throughout the five daily prayers. And the majority of scholars say that it is a good thing to do, to show our solidarity with the Muslims. And the most authentic opinion is that it is to be done by the instruction and the order of the Muslim Imam. So your Muslim Imam of your country, he orders the Imams, the Muslim ruler of your country, orders the Imams of the Masjid to make qunut, they should comply with that. If not, then they should not do that. My own personal opinion is that this qunut should be done to the areas afflicted by this calamity. Because if we keep on doing qunutun nazila for everything that happens to the Muslims around the world, we would never stop doing qunut throughout the whole year. Whether it's a, an earthquake in Morocco or floodings in Libya or a volcano in Indonesia, or a tornado and flooding in Bangladesh, or famine in Somalia, or wars in uh, uh, Syria, or oppression of our brothers and sisters of the Rohingya, or uh, uh, ogre in, in China, or a war here and there. This is going to continue throughout the whole year for decades. And this is not what I personally believe to be logical or part of Islam. Yes, there are calamities that may afflict our area, our country, our people, and those people in that area or these countries may make qunut and nazila, but others would not do this, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Maham from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. 
Um, my question is uh, that um, I made up the fast that uh, I missed due to menses uh, the um, in the previous Ramadan, but um, some of my fasts uh, have been made up which were missed the years before the previous uh, Ramadan. So, um, uh, so am I obliged to make them up before this Ramadan? Now, when a person has missed fasts, we do not record, okay, I have fasts from day 17 to day 24 of Ramadan five years ago. And then I have fasts from the first day of Ramadan to the 10th day of Ramadan four years ago. And when I make up, I check which date I missed. No, it's a lump sum. How many days have you missed? throughout your life, oh, I've missed approximately 25 days, Sheikh. And it doesn't matter which, which date were of the last year or the year before or the year before that and so forth. Therefore, these 25 days are considered to be a lump sum. You have to make up these 25 days without designating this day is for that year and this day is for the previous year and so on. You have done wrong if you were able in the past 11 months since last Ramadan till this Ramadan, you had the chance to fast so many days, you didn't. So when now Ramadan is next week and you're having panic attacks, whoops, what have I done? I have so many days, I can't make them up. Which should I make up in the next five, six days to compensate of this year or that year or the year before? No, it doesn't matter. Fast as many days as you can to make up before this Ramadan and ask Allah Azza wa for forgiveness for the remaining days. After Ramadan finishes, try to finish all what you have and Allah knows best. Ahna from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, what would be the ruling on a person who goes from a Muslim country like Bangladesh to a Kafir country for the purpose of studying? The scholars say that traveling to a non Muslim country is generally speaking not permissible if there are uh, uh, dangers and risks involved. And if there is a legitimate reason, then the leg this is permissible for a temporary period of time. What are these legitimate reasons? They say, like studying. Something that is not found, or the quality of it is not found except in these Kafir countries. So you want to study medicine. And you know that in Bangladesh, medicine is not uh, um, to a top-notch science that can be taught and gained in there. So you w decide to go to UK, to Europe, or to uh, North America, for example. But if you want to study, uh, let's say, business administration or normal things that you can study anywhere, then no, this is not a legitimate reason for you to go and study abroad. Among the legitimate reasons, um, business. You want to go and buy products, establish companies, um, get technology for factories, etc. This requires you going uh, to these countries. There's no problem in that. Also, uh, seeking medical health, uh, uh, assistance. So you go there for treatment. In your country or in other Muslim countries, they're not so advanced to reach the level of curing such an illness. You go to such places, there is no problem in that. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Uh, Zuhair from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Yes, inshallah, I'll be going to Umrah with my family in the next few days. So 
I know that being a traveler, I have to pray kasar when I'm not praying in the masjid. But of course, I'll be praying in Masjid Haram, Masjid Nabi. So I'll be praying the full fard rakat because I'll be praying in Jama. So what about the rawatif uh, sunnas? Should I pray them to get more reward, or they are not required? The sunnah for a traveler, as the Prophet used to do, alayhi salatu wasalam, is to skip the rawatib prayers, the sunnah prayers of Dhuhr, Maghrib, and Isha. So the four before Dhuhr, the two after Dhuhr, the two after Maghrib, and the two after Isha, the Prophet, when he traveled, used to skip them. So you don't pray those. Even if you pray complete prayers behind the Imam in the Masjid al-Haram in Mecca or in Medina, in Masjid al-Nabawi, you complete your prayer because you are a follower of the Imam. But you skip these rawatib. Other than that, if you decide to stay in Haram and you want <coughs> to pray 10 or 20 rak'ahs, voluntary prayers, when the time is permitted, the sky is the limit. You want to pray duha prayers. You want to pray uh, between adhan and iqama. You want to pray night prayers, tahajjud, witr. All of these are still valid and permissible. Adam from the UK. Hello. Adam. Yunus from Germany. Yunus. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum. Sheikh, there were times when I was very afraid of my father. And when I learned that um, if I'm forced to eat during an obligatory fast, I don't have to make up that day. You know, the things, there were some times I was fasting kafar or making a Ramadan. Um, I wish I got scared of that. And I, and I think I ate. Now the thing is, if I look back, then I don't know whether I can really say, okay, I was forced, otherwise I, I got this, I would get the stick, or I, just was afraid and there was no real fear. Like we can't say I was really forced. So should I now make up these kafara days in the Ramadan with others? First of all, we know that compulsion is an excuse. However, compulsion has to be genuine and real. Someone comes to me and says, Sheikh, I divorced my wife out of compulsion. I say to him, divorce due to compulsion doesn't take place, but um, excuse me, can you elaborate on how were you forced to divorce? He says, Sheikh, she came to me and said, if you don't divorce me, I'm not gonna cook lunch for you. There's no genuine compulsion here. She doesn't want to cook lunch for you. Go and buy food from outside. Don't eat lunch. Skip it. You're not going to die. So this is not true compulsion. You divorce, the divorce takes place. She says to me, if you don't uh, uh, divorce me, I'm going to strangle you. He look at you. You're 6'4", and you're uh, a strong man, and she's a weak woman. She can't str strangle you. No, this is not acceptable. But if he said... Sheikh, we are, uh, uh, she, uh, she forced me to divorce because she was standing at the balcony from the seventh floor and about to throw herself, and she's crazy. She did this many times. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, in this case, no. Your divorce is invalid because that's real compulsion. If, she, if he says that she was holding a knife to my throat and she was threatening to... Uh, uh, slaughter me. So, ooh, okay, the divorce doesn't take place. So again, we come to your father, 
with the stick. First of all, my advice to such parents, to fear Allah Azza wa Jal. What are you doing? You're raising cattle? You're raising your own children. And why do you force them and beat them up for worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal? If they were to wear a cross or to uh, go to a temple and, and, and worship a cow, you would be happy? Come on, fear Allah Azza wa Jal. You cannot deal and treat your children in such a barbaric way, especially when they are worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal. Otherwise, you may fall into the danger of exiting the fold of Islam. So this is my advice to such parents. Secondly, if you're not able to remember whether you were forced or not, but you're sure that you were, uh, uh, that you skipped fasting and you ate, this day has to be repeated because you don't have certainty of finishing it and completing it for the sake of Allah and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Eric from the US or Eric, I don't know. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Uh, this is Eric actually. Okay, Eric, what can I do for you? Uh, so, Sheikh, um, there's a hadith that says that uh, Prophet Ali Sallallahu said that whoever goes in the first hour of Friday gets the reward of uh, sacrificing a camel. Whoever goes in the second hour gets the reward of uh, sacrificing a cow and the hadith goes on. In this hadith, Sheikh, what's the meaning of first hour or second hour or how do I determine that? This, this is an issue of dispute among scholars and the most authentic opinion is that we divide the time between sunrise where we're allowed to pray al-ishraq prayers or the duha prayer starts which is approximately uh, uh, 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes <coughs> after sunrise. So from this time till the time of noon, let's assume that there are five hours, then each hour is designated for that hadith. If there are only four hours, then you divide it by five. If there are seven hours, you divide it by five and you get the period of time mentioned. And this was... Uh, mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, in Fath al-Bari by Al-Hafid ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, may Allah have mercy on him, where he said that these are called al-Sa'at al afaqiyah So this is one methodology of estimating it, and Allah knows best. Emma from the UK. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I realize that I should not study abroad in a mixed university or travel without a mahram as I am now. So upon telling my Muslim parents, they're not letting me return home to their Muslim country without a diploma abroad, nor accepting to study in their residing Muslim country. So if my efforts fail of convincing them, what should I do? Um, should I trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, book a plane ticket and maybe show at their door? I'm a muskeen in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all praises to him and those he grants knowledge to. Unfortunately, a lot of our daughters are stuck between a rock and a hard place, especially when their parents are ignorant and not practicing Islam. And a lot of our parents, unfortunately, fit this description. They know of Islam only what is cultural. So Simon says, do this, do that. What is the evidence from the Quran or from the Sunnah? They don't care and they don't comply. And they force their children to do things that go against Islam. So Emma's question is a typical example. Now, she traveled to a foreign Kafir country, unattended, without a mahram, and attending school in a mixed environment. And she is feeling the heat and the pressure of doing these haram things. Now she wants to go back, her parents refuse. 
and their refusal is in many cases due to our hesitation and being reluctant and weak. When we as children approach our parents in regards of issues of religion, we do this usually in a soft voice, in the sense that in a weak fashion, showing hesitation. This is when the parents put their foot down and insist without any room for discussion. No, you cannot marry this woman. No, you cannot work in that uh, job. And the boy comes and says, Sheikh, what should I do? I said, it's your mistake. If you're financially independent and you have a separate house and you have your own income, don't say, mom, I think I may want, I love to do this. No, no, no. Tell them I'm marrying this woman, full stop. If you ask them for their opinion, they will find hundreds of faults in her. She's short, she's dark, her family is this. She's uneducated, she doesn't have a job. And you'll never ever marry someone you want. Likewise, if you ask them about what you want to study or what you want to work. But if you put your foot down without any hesitation and tell them that this is what I want, they'll not be happy, but they'll swallow it and accept it. So when you go, go and talk to your parents, say, Dad, Mom, I am working, I am uh, st struggling, so many men, I'm being uh, uh, flirted upon, I am f finding it difficult, there's so much fitna, I fear for falling for haram, I have to travel, I have to do this. They would say, no, 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 it's okay, so be, be strong. Two more years and you'll, you'll manage. They don't think of the consequences. If you go back to them pregnant, it would be a catastrophe. But they come to me and say, Sheikh, she got pregnant. What should we do? She did not get married. I said, who sent her in the first place? Sheikh, we didn't think it's going to reach that stage. Well, now you know. So you have to put your foot down and be firm and confirm to them that I'm not going to do this. This is one option. Second option is to apply or, or to, to study wearing your full hijab and niqab and segregate yourself <coughs> from mixing with the opposite gender. And if it's safe for you to stay there and you keep your distance and you don't allow anyone from the opposite gender to speak to you or you don't uh, uh, approach them, inshallah, yani, this is a better and not a better, it's an acceptable solution with your circumstances. Third option is to change from working offline into online. So do your studies online if you can and do it without going and mixing and staying home. This would be, inshallah, an acceptable solution. And if nothing works, you simply book a ticket, fail your exams and go back home. Heidi from the Emirates. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, how are you, Sheikh? I'm fine, alhamdulillah. How can I help you? Alhamdulillah. Sheikh, I remember in your previous program, you advised us about the Rukia water, to do it on the water bottles, and you can consume maybe two days, mm -hmm. three days, seven days. Uh, is it possible if you can do the Rukia water on the water dispenser, the huge big bottle, and we can consume even for our tea, for for drinking day and night? Of course, you can do that without any hesitation or problem. Now, the best water to do ruqya upon is zamzam. But if you're living in the Emirates, it's difficult to get unlimited supply of it. So if you can mix it with normal bottles or uh, uh, tap water that is drinkable, that's fine. If not, then you can use the normal water that you buy in bottles or your tap water if it's uh, uh, fit for uh, human consumption and it's healthy. And you can do ruqya to drink from it, to use it with coffee, tea, and the likes, and to cook with it without any problem, inshallah. We have a short break. Stay tuned, and inshallah, we'll be right back.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today we're going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Anas ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, said, Out of all the Ansar in Medina, Abu Talha had the most date palm trees, and the most beloved of his land was Bayraha, a piece of land that faces the mosque. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to enter it and drink from some water therein. When the verse which means, never will you attain good reward until you spend in the way of Allah from that which you love, was revealed, Abu Talha stood and said to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger of Allah, the Almighty says, never will you attain good reward until you spend in the way of Allah from that which you love. And the most beloved part of my wealth is Bayraha. Therefore, it is a charity for the sake of Allah. And I hope that Allah accepts it and stores it for me in my record for good deeds. So use it in any way Allah shows you. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, This is such a good action. This is profitable wealth. I have heard what you have said, but I see that you should give it to your relative. Abu Talha, may Allah be pleased with him, said, I shall do so, O Messenger of Allah. So Abu Talha divided it between his relatives and cousins, and among them were Hassan and Ubay ibn Ka'b. That is how the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to advise them about which places are more suitable for charity. Reported by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Uh, Brother Aman from India. Aman, hi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa wa barakatuh. How can I help you? So, Sheikh, my question is, uh, we know there are three du'as when we wake up. Uh, Alhamdulillah, ahyana and uh, last 10 verse of Ali Imran and La ilaha illallah until end. So, so my question is, if I didn't wake up in the middle of the night, rather wake up just before Fajr or in Fajr or after Fajr, should I recite these du'as and will I get the benefits of these du'as? The du'a of La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah, lahul mulku lahul hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illa Allah, wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, Rabbi ghfirli, and you ask Allah for dua. This is related to waking up before Fajr prayer and then making wudu and praying tahajjud in addition to witr. But if you woke up few minutes before that, would that be applicable? Inshallah, it's applicable. But would you get the same reward as those who will pray to Hajjud and Witr as well? I doubt that. But there is no harm in saying it and also say, Alhamdulillah, and the likes afterwards. Wallahu a'lam. Fuad from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa barakatuh. How are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah. So, Sheikh, actually my question was, a uh, da'i of the subcontinent said that if a person performs a voluntary act in the month of Ramadan, it's equal to one obligatory act in other months. And if a person performs one obligatory act in the month of Ramadan, it's equivalent to 70 obligatory acts in other months. So, my question is, is it authentic, Sheikh, and is there any hadith regarding about it? Jazakallah khairan. Wa jazakum. This is based on a weak hadith that is not authentic. However, a lot of the da'is and the scholars use it, whether they don't know of its weakness, and that is, it's not authentic, 
or whether they know, but they think it is in the field of fada'ilul a'mal, and it is not related to aqidah, and not related to halal and haram, so it's okay to utilize it. But the hadith is not authentic. Nisa from Germany. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Is it permissible to do the theoretical driving license test in a place where men and women are together, but everyone has his own separated computer place? As long as you are wearing your hijab and uh, uh, appropriately and you're not mixing with others, there's no problem in that, inshallah. Zishan from Kashmir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Take, uh, in my locality, uh, there are people who don't actually, we people don't actually observe ethic of anyone among us. So last year I observed ethic of and uh, I was the only one in the um, mosque. So after uh, I observed ethic of uh, after three, four months of Ramadan, I, I began to get involved in a lot of sins and that has really affected me. But now this year, <clears throat> a lot of young uh, kids are coming to me and asking me if I'm going to observe Etikaf again with them so that uh, I might help them. But I'm feeling ashamed and I don't know. I'm just thinking that uh, I should not observe Etikaf this year because I have not done such good deeds in the past year. So what's your suggestion for me? Zishan Bahai, I'm going to ask you two questions. Are you with me? Yes. Number one, if you don't perform i'tikaf because of your being ashamed of your sins is shaitan happy or angry happy okay when shaitan is happy allah is angry now yeah second option if you perform i'tikaf and take these boys with you and mashallah you engage in ibadah and Quran, reading the quran and the likes is shaitan angry or happy? Angry. And does this please Allah? Yes, of course. Is there a third option? Yes or no? I don't think so. I think uh, pleasing Allah is the most important thing. Khalas. Either you obey shaitan and anger Allah, or you disobey shaitan and please Allah, and you get your answer, inshallah. Aqib from Canada. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, Sheikh, uh, my question is Our Prophet wasalam, has prohibited us to ask for haram stuff, right? In dua. In so, dua, correct. But, yes. So, but yet, if a person asks for haram things out of his desire, and then if he gets it out and he praises, but knowing that it is haram, and this is ridicule. This is not ridiculing, but acknowledging it is haram. So what would be the ruling on him? Will He is will sinful. He would be sinful, but it is not what you are thinking of. That, oh, he asked for something that is haram, and he's praising Allah for something that is haram. So, so this makes him a kafir. This is how shaitan wants you to think. And you said it. He's not ridiculing it. He's stupid. That's all. Yani, you, you know that Allah prohibited haram. Allah prohibited fornication. Yet you say, oh Allah, let me have this one night with this woman. And you know it's haram. And Allah hates this. And Allah Azza wa Jal is angered by it. But out of weakness, out of knowing that no one can facilitate anything except with Allah's permission, you do this stupid act and you get it thinking that, oh, you've got it made and you're a lucky one. This is stupid. But I wouldn't say that, oh, you've exited the fold of Islam. Because exiting the fold of Islam is not something that is easy. Yes, it's a major sin, what you have done. You're going to be punished like Allah knows how in your grave in, in, in on the hereafter and also in this life with the depression, with all the whole nine yards. But this does not take you out of the fold of Islam. Suleiman from Switzerland. 
السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله وبركاته uh, شيخ got a question about um, creating picture with AI I know the fact that uh, creating life forms like human or animal is haram so the thing is is it the same for like clothing armor if the parts are stick together and look like a human body but does it have a facial feature and heads and the likes or just the clothes oh, uh, it has a helm too it, but it, it's it, only uh, it has a what uh, a armor helmet no no as long as it does not see akhi again if it is 2d it is a design on the computer so it's not an actual 3d statue or structure that I have in front of me, if it's 2D or 3D on my computer and it does not have any facial features, a helmet or a head without any eyes, nose or mouth and a body, this is permissible insha'Allah. Sayyida from the, uh, from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu Okay. Yes, Sayyida. Sheikh, my question is that, okay, if a woman's husband has passed away, so is her father-in-law still her mahram? Because yes. A lot of people in my family said it, uh, he isn't. So what is the ruling on that? There is no dispute among any of the Muslims that the father-in-law is the mahram of his daughter-in-law of his son's wife forever, whether the son is alive or dead. He is her mahram forever until they die. They can never get married. They can never have any, uh, um, it's like your own father. So whatever your family is telling you, it is totally bogus and baseless and they have no knowledge of Islam, none whatsoever. Don't ever listen to them. Yusuf from the Emirates. Thank you. You're welcome. Yusuf? Yusuf from the Emirates. Abdul Malik from France. Hello. Salam alaikum. Salam. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, uh, I signed up to a huge hacking competition with my team. My university paid for everything, uh, hotel, food, a thousand of euro. But later on, I saw that it may be halal. So I didn't know the reason why I'm playing. In the other hand, the competition will give us notoriety from the rec recruiter. And this can help me secure a first halal job since it's hard for Arab in France to find a job. Inshallah, it will help me to make Ijra, uh, and I don't mind working for the Saudi army since hacking is a war. So now what to do in my situation since I'm going to the competition? What kind of competition is it, Abdel Malik? H hacking competition, you know. I, I, oh, like I, hackathon. Yeah, I, I can use this for army, for Saudi army, for example. No, no problem. No problem in that, Inshallah. Uh, Omar from the UK. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Sheikh, um, um, I really want to memorize the, the Quran, Sheikh, but recently I've been struggling with my niyyah, with my intention. I feel like I'm doing it because my parents want me to do it. And, Sheikh, yeah, I've been really struggling with it. So, is there any um, advice for me, Sheikh? Again, I'm going to ask you two questions, Umar, similarly to what I asked one of the brothers uh, before. Question number one. When you want to memorize the Qur'an and you get whispers doubting your intention, you have one of two options, and correct me if I'm wrong. Either you stop, which means that you obey shaitan, or you continue to memorize it, which means that you disobey shaitan. Is there a third option, Akhi? No. In, thi in this case, definitely disobey shaitan, Continue to memorize the Qur'an with a twist. And that is to make your intention for the sake of Allah and seeking Allah's pleasure. 
but never ever obey shaitan and stop doing good uh, 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 things because this is what shaitan wants from you and you're smart enough to know that this is not good for your akhirah. Maryam from Canada. Assalamu alaikum. Salam wa um, I need to give a kafara for a broken oath, but I can't find an online charity that shows the meals they give to the poor people. Um, and if they do, like, it's not the average meal that I eat. Um, I can tell, like, a family member back home to give for me, but it'll be hard for them. So do you have any advice on this? Jazakallah khairan. Well, Jazakallah First of all, it is not necessary that the meal we know of, because nowadays with so many thousands and hundreds of thousands of meals a day given by such charity organizations to the poor Muslims around the world, it's almost impossible to know what they are feeding them. But we know that it fulfills the minimal requirement. So when Allah says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, min awsati ma tutu'imuna ahlikum, from the average of what you feed your family, these organizations usually give 1.5 kilograms of rice, raw rice, which is sufficient for like seven or eight meals for an individual. They give it to one individual. So this far exceeds my uh, T-bone steak medium well, because this is one meal and that is a lot to them. So there is no problem. You don't have to go into details. As they say, the devil is in the details. As long as it's a trustworthy organization, they tell you we will feed people in Syria or in Yemen or in um, Iraq or in Lebanon or in Jordan for the refugee camps. There is no problem in that. And Allah knows best. Nurullah from Australia. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam to Allah. Just had a question as to what the ruling is when playing video games on using female characters or female skins which don't fully cover the body or wear a revealing dress. If not, it makes no difference to the gameplay. This is not permissible. Anything that involves the opposite gender women being in uh, um, revealing clothes, this is haram. You cannot watch this even if it's an anime or it's cartoons or video games as long as there is fitna and there is revealing clothes involved and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. This is all the time we have for tonight until we meet you tomorrow Sunday at 4 o'clock or maybe 4.10 after Asr prayer. I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين